Welcome to Safe on Deck. For episode 30, I sat down with Commander Matthew Nardi in Lakeland, Florida. Commander Nardi earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Environmental Science from Cornell University in 2003, before enlisting into the United States Air Force as an aerospace electrical technician. Commander Nardi deployed around the world, working on the A-10 Thunderbolt II and the C-130 Hercules aircraft. In 2008, Commander Nardi earned his commission in the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, Commissioned Officer Corps, and he sailed aboard NOAA Ship Rainier and NOAA Ship Fairweather before joining Navigation Response Team 5 in New York City, New York. In 2012, Commander Nardi earned a coveted spot in NOAA Aircraft Operations, where he qualified as an aircraft commander and instructor pilot in the de Havilland Twin Otter, the Beechcraft King Air, and the Gulfstream 4 SP. Commander Nardi currently serves as Chief of Safety, Standardization, and Training Branch at the NOAA Aircraft Operations Center, headquartered at the Lakeland Lanier Regional Airport in Lakeland, Florida. NOAA's fleet of 10 manned aircraft significantly enhance scientists' understanding of hurricanes, improve the accuracy of tropical cyclone forecasts, and play a vital role in monitoring our environment through marine mammal population studies, shoreline change assessments, water resource and snow surveys, air chemistry studies, remote sensing projects, and emergency response missions. Thanks for taking the time to listen. In the future, I plan to continue to share similar interviews with both current and retired military aviators. If you have a question or a suggestion for a future interview, please leave it as a comment below. Safe on Deck, Episode 30, with Commander Matthew Nardi. Enjoy. Commander Nardi, thanks again so very much for having uh, having us by the hangar here today in beautiful Lakeland. I had a, just finished up an awesome, awesome tour. Um, I start all these interviews the same way. We'll start yours the same way as well. Where were you born? I was born in Babylon, New York, on the south shore of Long Island. New York. Very cool. Well, Florida's a little bit away from there, so we'll talk, talk about how you got here. Went to undergrad in uh, Cornell University. Uh, before that, I did a lot of outdoor stuff, was in the Boy Scouts and Eagle Scout and all that. So... Spent a lot of time outdoors, understanding the environment, appreciation for the environment and everything, and did uh, Cornell Outdoor Education, leading backpacking classes and canoeing classes and everything. It didn't uh, really register like a lot of paths that we've all found ourselves, winding roads. It didn't, it only makes sense looking backwards, right? So went from Cornell University in undergrad and then to the Air Force as an enlisted troop fixing C-130s and A-10s, and then eventually to ships in NOAA and aircraft in NOAA. How, how did you find your way to NOAA in general from the Air Force? I, mean, I, I know it's such a small organization. What was, your, what was your path into it? One of my dad's friends actually was, uh, he went to the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy. He was a merchant mariner by trade, and he knew about NOAA Corps just by chance. Like, you found out through you know, a friend of yours, and I found out through my dad's friend, a lot of it is word of mouth because we're so small, you know, of the eight uniform service services, by far the smallest, 350 approximately officers, uh, by an order of magnitude, the smallest next to the U.S. Public Health Service. Wow, so, I did not realize yeah, that. Yeah, a lot of people understand uh, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, those are the ones people can rattle off and they say, oh yeah, but there's the Coast Guard. Oh, yeah, they added that Space Force recently, and there's the U.S. Public Health Service, and then uh, next to Public Health Service, um, like I said, an order of magnitude smaller, 350 commissioned uniformed officers is the NOAA Commission Corps. And NOAA is more than just aviation. I'll be honest, because I'm an aviator. It's apparently all I ever think about is aviation. But I didn't realize until today's tour how many ships you have, and that's kind of where you, so to speak, got your feet wet. Uh, Could you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. NOAA has um, a fleet of ships that it uses for oceanographic, hydrographic, and fisheries surveys and research. Uh, They're based all around continental United States, uh, Hawaii, and Alaska. And generally they're run by a crew, a deck crew of civilian mariners. And then the officers, the commissioned officers, drive the ships. Um, Also, the officers get involved in some of the science, as well as operating some of the small boats. Very cool. So what uh, was your kind of, I want to say fleet experience, I guess the Navy terminology I know. What was your fleet experience on those ships? So on the ships, I was a deck officer on NOAA ship Rainier in Fairweather. So I spent three years up in Alaska crashing into waves and having fun up there. 
uh, deploying small boats every day. So that was always a very dynamic evolution. Um, a lot of fun, a lot different than open water, steaming and dreaming. So they say, listening to music on the bridge or anything like that, it was always like very close quarters, navigating with sharp pointy rocks on both sides and deploying ships, um, sometimes in protected coves because of the dynamic weather of Alaska, doing diving operations off the small boats because we were doing hydrographic survey. So we're measuring the depth of the ocean bottom. There's so many things that go into that, like the tides, the amount of tidal, uh, data that you're you're surveying that the sound uh, speed of sound through the water which is affected by the temperature and salinity as well as uh, horizontal controls for real-time kinematic GPS positioning so all of those things involve a lot of work on shore and underneath the water and I really like that it was a very dynamic job got to get involved in so many things from the diving to the driving small boats to going on shore and installing tide gauges, leveling tide gauges, installing stuff into rocks, and uh, really just like I said with the introduction and outdoor education background, just so much fun and such a great way to integrate that outdoor experience into the environment, getting that environmental intelligence, and then having it impact a mission that affects so many people's lives. That's really, really neat. I think so many of us, we're so used to, you know, you look at your phone, you get all this data, right? And what has to come from somewhere, someone did the hard work to, you know, basically put those sensors in place, throw those satellites up in the sky, and that was you. That's so very, very cool. And it sounds like something you really had a passion for, too, so, and still have a passion for, it sounds like, I as well. I really do. Where yeah. did aviation fit into that? What was, uh, what was kind of your path into uh, the flying side of things? Did not have a lot of that um, in undergrad, really. Uh, and then I went into the Air Force. I had a brief foray into Air Force Special Forces. Uh, did not get uh, through that training. Uh, not necessary to get into the details there, but it's uh, it suffice to say I have so much respect for people involved in that special operations community. And just like not everybody is cut out to be a pilot, we all come with our unique skills, knowledge, abilities, backgrounds. Uh, not everybody is cut out to be a special warfighter. Uh, super amount of respect for those folks. Uh, did not work out during special operations training with the, with the Air Force, uh, but I did reclass into maintenance. That was not on the shiny brochure. It was not part of my plan, but I rolled with the punches and um, really got a phenomenal experience going out to Spangdahl in Germany to fix A-10s, and then later Fayetteville, North Carolina to fix C-130s. And that's really where I got more of the aviation bug. I grew up on Long Island close to Mitchell Field, which is kind of a birthplace of a lot of aviation. It's where Charles Lindbergh took off originally for his transatlantic flight. A lot of uh, birthplace of aviation type background there, but I didn't really have the bug growing up the way a lot of people do. Like when I was 10 years old, there I was. Uh, it was really when I was 23 years old and uh, fixing a C-130 out on an active ramp in, uh, I think it was Al-Assad Air Base, or one of those ones in Iraq where uh, you're just trying to get the mission done and get back home to Ali al Salim in Kuwait, where we were based at that time. And man, it was just so great seeing the whole organization come together, a lot of people um, just integrating together, air crew with the maintenance crew, with the flight crew, and everybody making sure the maintenance happened to make sure everybody got home safely. So after I saw that evolution uh, up close, that's really what like hooked me. If I could integrate that environmental intelligence passion with this maintenance, you know, air crew team mentality, I, I could really have something there. And the best place in the world to do it is where we're sitting right now at NOAA. I hope so. So where did you go first? What, uh, what platform did you fly first when you started flying for NOAA? I started with the Twin Otter, the DHC-6 uh, Twin Otter. That's where the bulk of our people who come in, uh, especially if you don't have previous military experience on the P-3, the bulk of our people start flying the Twin Otter. It's a great primary trainer. Um, it has a lot of um, you know, unique handling characteristics, huge rudder, huge control surfaces, great low speed control ability. 
uh, a really great stick and rudder platform for new pilots to cut their teeth on, so to speak. And uh, it's also such a versatile airplane being unpressurized. Uh, putting different sensors on it is much easier than more of our pressurized airplanes, so it is used for a very diverse background of principal investigators or scientists, and they integrate so many different sensors and projects, and it's great for somebody new to the organization to really understand the broad base of all of NOAA's mission sets. A lot of people know the hurricane hunting business, but uh, we're more than just hurricanes now. We do a lot of fisheries, we do a lot of coastal mapping, we do a lot of snow survey, environmental research of all kinds. Any scientist that needs to get a mission done, we make them, we, we get it done. We bring them to the science. So you're brand new, you just got off the boat, and now you're going to go, I mean, you're zero to hero here, right? Did you have a private pilot's license or any kind of exposure before uh, NOAA? I did have a private pilot's license, but that was it. Okay. I was private pilot's license and just a handful of hours over that. Probably Single engine land, probably. In okay, so real basic. So zero to here. Where did, where did Noah send you to get that first? It's a multi-engine airplane, obviously the twin honor. Where did yep. you go first with that training? So I went to Vero Beach, Florida, which is um, over on the east coast of Florida. And it uh, at the time, it was run by Flight Safety, but it's a private commercial um, commercial outfit that's basically training people up from, uh, from zero. Um, we are a uniformed service, so there's a certain amount of interface with other military outfits, um, but really that commercial flight training, because of our diversity of operations and how we go into and out of uncontrolled fields so much and interface with the NAS, um, we don't do as much of the form flying that military does or the controlled airspace warning areas. MOAs, you know, a lot of our mission sets are a lot more closely tied to civilian aircraft operations. So that training in, uh, in Vero Beach was really, uh, really formative, uh, just in understanding how to navigate the southeast United States in a small single engine turbo pro or uh, piston aircraft. You can't get over these buildups. You got to get around them. And the same is definitely true of a Twin Otter. The uh, sim, the only sim in the world I think we talked about earlier for uh, the Twin Otter is in Canada, right? So I'm guessing going up there next to get that, is it a type rating that you get in the sim? It is not a type rating because the aircraft is 12,500 pounds. Ah, so okay. if it were 12,501 pounds, you would need a type rating. So they don't require type rating for the Twin Otter, but the training is very similar to a type rating. Uh, it's a week of ground school where you learn the basic systems. Going from piston to turbine is definitely a big jump with that. The performance involved is a big jump. Um, and the crew coordination aspect can be a big jump for people. You're going from single pilot resource management to crew resource management. That aspect of somebody reading a checklist and somebody else verifying or checking is different for a lot of people. It's definitely been a, a great experience uh, going to uh, Toronto. They've been phenomenal um, really training partners, the same people up there each year and you get to know them as well as some of our instructors sometimes. They all have their their unique perspectives on flying and they get to know our operations and it ends up being more of an organizational conversation with a lot of these sim operators because they really need to know how we operate. Sometimes we have very unique uh, requests about things that we do in the sim, low-level stuff or unique box canyon maneuvers or things like that that other, other operators, just A to B operators that are commercial operators, don't think about and we really ask to dive into, and they've been great partners with that. So home station for you is here in Lakeland, Florida, but your work happens on the road. I mean, there's things going on in the Gulf, but I mean, you're flying literally anywhere that you could think of in the, in, I'm going to say the U.S., but you know, broadly speaking, you're, you're ranging out. Uh, and one thing I want to talk about, obviously, you uh, kind of have, oh gosh, well, you, of all the manned platforms, you fly three of the four. So the Twin Otter, the C-12, and then the Gulfstream, and we'll get into those here as we go on. So pretty much everything but the P-3, unless I'm, unless I'm missing anything. That's so, right. A wide variety, which is really, really awesome. Um, but with the Twin Otter specifically, where it was just kind of, let's travel the globe. Where did you go? What were kind of some of those first, I'm going to use air quotes here, deployments, but I don't know what the right terminology is, maybe a trip or uh, missions. Where, where did you go with the airplane? Sure. On our uh, TDY is usually what we call it, TDY for a mission, and uh, we go up to Southeast Rice 
right whale was my first one out in Brunswick, Georgia, out on the coast of Georgia, a beautiful place um, and very, very great mission set. Um, you get to live uh, in the same area as the scientists on this place, St. Simon's Island, that's like kind of a summer paradise. You're, you're not there in the summer, it's in the winter time, so it looks a little bit different in the winter than it does in the summer. But still, very nice place. Uh, also, northeast right whales. So these right whales are endangered creatures. Uh, Congress has a mandated mission to monitor them. And if they get entangled, we circle them until a crew can come out and free them from the nets. There are also various regulations that go into effect depending on which animals they find where. They can put different speed restrictions or um, route restrictions on um, Air, on not aircraft, but ships coming into and out of port. So the right whale mission has been very formative for myself and a lot of other pilots. Uh, coastal mapping, uh, which we do with the LIDAR, uh, light detection and ranging on the Twin Otter, basically mowing the lawn and getting uh, water depths as you go back and forth. Uh, that's a very bread and butter mission. It's very near and dear to my heart because of my background on the ships. I did hydrography out on the ships. Uh, this is kind of the other side to the hydrography. And it really, it's, a, it's an area where, um, it's sort of the background of NOAA. It's where NOAA came from. So Thomas Jefferson had the survey of the coast and the founding of the nation right after uh, they made the army. They decided they were losing more ships due to shipwrecks than they were to uh, naval encounters. So they said, how can we lose less ships? We need to map the coast. So Thomas Jefferson made the survey of the coast. And shortly after that, um, that became the Office of Coast Survey. A guy named Ferdinand Hassler uh, took up a project to map New York Harbor. That project took significantly longer than expected, uh, as is wont to be the case occasionally. Uh, 30 years, I believe it was, it took to map out the initial charts for New York Harbor, but it's one of those things we stand on the shoulders of giants. It's one of the first things that got done, and we still build on that today with our our knowledge of baselining, a depth, coming up with one thing that we know, and then coming up with sensors that can derive parts of that to everything that we could know, from sensors in the water, multi-beam side scan sonar to uh, sensors in the air and even satellites. So one of the things I always like to ask about with different aviators, you know, stories in the weather, emergencies, uh, deployments, so we're kind of going through that as well. With these missions you're doing the Twin R, it's like a pickup truck, and that's, I think, well, at least the beauty that I gathered from seeing that airplane. You can put so much in it, so that with that variety, I'm, I'm sure there's challenges as well. It's, uh, it's two of you up front, and again, if I, if I say something incorrectly, stop me, but there's a, you know, two flight crew up front, and then what's going in the back of the airplane? For every mission, it's going to be something different, different folks in the back, I'm guessing. That's right. Uh, for our marine mammal missions, typically there could be four to up to six people in the back that are looking out of different ports and windows and collecting the data and recording the data. Uh, some of our other missions, like coastal mapping, there's just one person in the back generally, unless somebody is doing training that's operating the gear. And then for our snow survey mission, Sometimes we do have an operator in the background and sometimes the pilots operate the gear uh, because it's largely a set and forget type device where you set it uh, after you start up engines, then you get in the seat, you fly the whole mission profile and you land and then after you land, you, uh, you stop the data. So highly variable based on what we're accomplishing in the back. But generally speaking, it's, uh, it's just a small, very flexible set of people I'd say that's been my overarching experience of NOAA has been flexibility. Uh, it's part of the, the challenges of being a small organization, but also the excitement of being part of a team that's really getting things done. And when you see change that needs to happen, man, there's nothing like being on the front lines and being able to make a change. And then if there's a policy that isn't working for you, you're uh, barely one one level of uh, removal from that person that, you know, usually it's your boss or your boss's boss that's in charge of that policy. So if it's not working, if it doesn't make sense, if uh, we need to make an operational risk management assessment, we can get that evaluated and do it in a safe and controlled way and not just have 
groups in the field trying to make decisions on their own. We really have a, a fast and flexible group that can make the safest decisions in the, in the shortest amount of time, I think. You talked about snow survey. I know nothing about that mission set. What, uh, where in the U.S. are you doing that? What does that look like? Why are you doing it? A snow survey is uh, generally in continental United States, lower Canada, and Alaska. So we've got a, a network of about 3,800 lines, and we fly the same lines year in, year out, and get a, a background data. And we're flying this 330-pound sodium iodide crystal in the back of the plane, uh, whether it's a Twin Otter or a King Air. We're flying it at the same airspeed, uh, 125 knots, or 135 for the King Air, 100 for the Twin Otter. Uh, same altitude, 500 feet AGL. And then we get the background data. That's the ambient uh, gamma radiation that's always around us. It's being emanated from the ground in the form of potassium, uranium, and thorium. And then this 330-pound sodium iodide crystal actually glows. It glows in the back. It's got little photoreceptor tubes. We get that background data and come up with the depth of the snowpack. So the difference between the background data when you fly it without snow and then the attenuation from the water that's in the, uh, in the snowpack uh, is actually the, the snow water equivalent, or SWE. So we get a, a, a measurement in centimeters, and that's the centimeters of SWE, and that could be in standing water, it could be in ground ice, it could be in snow, uh, hard pack snow or deep pack snow. And then that is going to feed into the models of the water managers, generally speaking, for the drought issues they're having on the west coast um, or of the river center forecasters that are trying to figure out spring flooding models. Sounds like incredibly important stuff and things, I mean, literally people's livelihoods, people's lives depend on this data. And again, you wouldn't, I mean, I don't know, you just assume that it comes from somewhere. This is, this is where it comes from. Absolutely. And it's great to meet people on the road that it impacts uh, in the Midwest, the Red River Valley has flooded several times in the area of Minot, Grand Forks, and Fargo. And to meet people who say, oh, I remember that flood five years ago, and, you know, understand that, like, wow, you are doing these things that have true impact on people. You mentioned 500 feet. I want to get back to that. 500 feet altitude. You're, uh, you're not up there in the bososphere in that, in that little airplane. You are down low, weaving up the freeway. What's it like flying in that environment? Because you, I'm guessing some of this is very rural, maybe a little bit of urban. Um, what, what's it like flying down low in a Twin Otter? It's not a small airplane. Is it something that's a challenge or something you just you rise to that occasion and you're, you're ready to do it? There's birds down there, there's cell phone towers down there, all that stuff. Absolutely. It's, uh, it's definitely a challenge and it's not anything that we take lightly. We always uh, pre-brief our lines and uh, make sure that we keep building on the organizational knowledge that we've built up. Uh, we have these procedures in place where we have checklists. We make sure that we like pre-brief the lines. Uh, I guess in the military, you call it chumming the charts. Uh, you Absolutely. probably have spent hours and days chumming charts. Uh, we do probably a similar process, but uh, it's more on foreflight nowadays. And it's this iterative process and just making sure you don't get complacent because that one tower that's at 1,000 feet, which in the flat Midwest could very well happen, uh, that is that one that's going to cause you a problem. And seeing a, cell, seeing a cell phone tower is not hard. Seeing a radio tower can be extremely difficult. I'm sure you see them low level all the time. And uh, in the mountains, it becomes even uh, more difficult in terms of weather planning, uh, making sure that you have an exit uh, no matter where you're going. Uh, the weather can obviously be very localized in the mountains, so making sure you set yourself up for success. Because I think a lot of these, uh, these missions, the takeaway that I've always seen is that you can really do them all very safely in the right conditions. But if you line yourself up in the right in the wrong situation with the wrong weather at the wrong time, all of a sudden you've really stacked the deck against yourself. And that's where operational risk management uh, frameworks come up. We make sure that we have uh, objective gates that people have to meet to fly these, uh, both in terms of training and as well as environmental conditions. And also we allow our experienced crews subjective 
um, latitude to make their go no go decisions without any kind of punitive measures. Um, it's easier said than done. Making a good safety culture is one of those elusive things that we're all um, that we're all going for. I'm the chief of safety standardization and training branch here, so that's uh, near and dear to my heart. Very passionate. Absolutely. It's trust. At the end of the day, you as the aviator, and I'm, I'm going to speak for myself here briefly, but uh, if, if I have um, I don't know, the scientists in the back of the airplane, or in my case, flying in the Navy, the crew, uh, you know what the mission is, right? You've got a mission to accomplish, and I'm going to do everything I can to accomplish it safely. But at a certain point, I have my off-ramps. When they start to escape, there's only one left. Okay, I'm done. This is the last one I'm taking, because after that, there's the mishap. And uh, I'm sure we all have you know, personal stories. I'm very passionate about aviation safety for a couple of reasons, some of which I'll share with you afterwards, um, off the air, as they say. But yeah, uh, we all know folks that are better aviators than, uh, than us that have you know, had something bad happen. And you want to learn from that and share it with others. Um, so I imagine that trust between you and the scientists in the back. They're probably going to ask for anything and everything. And you, at a certain point, as the aviator, say, hey, I've, we've done all we can. And here's the off-ramp. Here's where we're going to go back, land the airplane, or maybe we're not going to get this line done. Absolutely. Yeah, I think back to a, a time going into uh, Dutch Harbor, Alaska. Uh, operating that on the Aleutian chain is a good example of where things come in really fast there. Uh, the atmosphere is very stable, which sounds like a good thing, but that just means it's a slow-moving soup there. So if a, a light breeze comes the wrong way, you have a 200-foot overcast that's like coming in real quick. And uh, coming into Dutch Harbor, uh, there's just a few approaches, and um, it's one way or the other, and it kind of sits in a bowl, and there's a mountain in front of the bowl, which is a really good setup for a nice protected harbor, a really bad setup for an airport. So you can only do this uh, approach during the daytime. Uh, we were doing it in the daytime, but it was getting close to nighttime. I knew that we were gonna land uh, in daylight, so I knew we were good there. But the thing you have to keep in mind with uh, uncontrolled approaches, you get in the mindset of, CONUS, United States, actively controlled. You're doing ILS approach down to minimums, boom, go missed, radar vectors. You're doing another approach in like two minutes. If you're uncontrolled out in the Aleutian Islands in a twin otter, now to do a mist, you have to go mist. You have to do it before the mountain, because if you do it after the mountain, now you're pretty much VFR feeling your way around the mountain, hopefully VFR. And now you have to climb up to 8,000 feet to be able to talk to Anchorage Center and come up with a new plan. Uh, that's a whole lot different than doing an ILS approach over in an actively controlled VHF uh, environment. So it, it was definitely one of those moments where I thought, okay, let's make sure we stack all the other cards in our favor. Um, and we got down below the below the clouds, made sure that we got in on time. But I think those are the moments where you think back to it and you think, I had one card that I played that was not a smart card. And be honest about that. Don't try to hide it and try to share it with as many people and make sure that we learn from it. Um, we don't want to beat ourselves up. And, you know, that's the other side of that is, you know, the self-beating up exercise of, uh, of briefing it in front of a group, um, that's, that can be one extreme. But we want to make sure that we learn, and I think the, uh, that's the, the organizational mindset of that positive safety culture breeds that. Okay, we talked about the low-altitude flying environment. Any, uh, any good There I Was stories? I'd say the Midwest is very dynamic, especially in the wintertime. Uh, and the v VFR weather minimums down there uh, as you know, class golf, one mile, clear of clouds, um, puts you in a, a lot of latitude there with the FARs. Uh, too much latitude at times. One statute mile and clear of clouds is really bad weather to be flying around in. Uh, anybody who's been in uh, something close to that is going to call it IFR real quick. And certainly not a place to be finding 1,000 foot um, cell phone towers or anything like that. So I'd say that Flying around uh, Lake Superior one year, uh, it was one of those classic uh, scud running. You go up, it looks okay, 3,000 foot turns into 2,000 foot, and then once 2,000 foot starts getting into less than that, now you start looking for that out. And that's what we tried to do, and tried to do, and tried to do, 
until it was like, okay, this doesn't make any sense. Up is a better direction than down and contacted our approach frequency and made sure that we got an IFR clearance and then climbed up. Sometimes down is the way that the mission is and that's where it wants to draw you to. They got the magnet drawing you down. But in the end, there's less things that you're going to hit that are up than down. For sure, especially out in the Midwest where it's all exactly. it's all good and flat. Yeah. Very cool. Um, at what point did you, and again, we talked about three different platforms, three different missions, obviously, but when did you go from the Twin Otter to the C-12, or I'm going to call it the C-12, the King Air, Sure. and then why? What was the transition? Why did, why did that occur? I spent about three or four years on the Twin Otter, um, and it was really just a continuation of the same mission sets. The King Air did a coastal mapping mission set at the time that I joined. I knew that we were going to get another King Air and eventually do snow survey. The bulk of my flying that I did in the uh, Twin Otter was snow survey. I have a great passion for that project. It's got such a great immediate impact and it's also just fun flying. Uh, like a lot of fun flying, if you stack the cards in your favor and you do it safely, it's the best flying that you'll do. Uh, it can also be uh, challenging um, if you do it in bad conditions. So that's where we make sure that we have our operational risk management and our organizational framework to make sure that we don't do things like that. And don't get a get their itis or mission complete completion itis, whatever you want to call it. It's a, it's a common organizational trap of just good intention, intentioned people wanting to get things done and then doing things that you wouldn't ordinarily do. So I continued on the King Air to do the coastal mapping and the snow survey mission. And uh, it was really the mission sets that inspired me to go over there. We talked about uh, two different airplanes though, right? So uh, Twin Otter high wing twin turboprop, now a King Air, it's gonna be a little bit faster, low wing twin turboprop. What are some of the challenges of flying those? Again, I assume you, you think you still maintain the qual, right, on those, on those airplanes. But what are some of the challenges with flying those both uh, in, like you did, similar mission sets, but just two different airplanes entirely? I mean, heck, for the Twin Otter, the power levers are literally, I'm, I'm moving my hand and no one can see it, up high as opposed to the PCL and a King Air's down low. Just little stuff like that. Was it a challenge to keep it all, keep it all straight and continue to keep it all straight as you fly these different airplanes? I would say between the King Air and the Twin Otter, it wasn't too bad. Controllability... Uh, is generally similar. Uh, certainly the engine configuration uh, is a little bit different, but uh, similar engines. Um, we've got the, the Pratt & Whitney uh, engines on both, so it's uh, different mission sets. Uh, I would say that the Otter, despite it being like our uh, quote entry level airplane that's where a lot of our new people go but I th actually think that stick and rudder wise it can be harder it can really be a handful with that big barn door rudder it's a great force for good but it's a great force for evil <laughs> so you need to know how to use it um, so doing a, a crosswind landing in a in a twin otter is a thing of art and uh, it can be done very safely and very effectively um, not having the nose wheel connected to the, uh, it's got a tiller, so it is not connected to the, uh, to the pedals. So that can be a bit of a challenge if you land uh, uncoordinated, all of a sudden you're going in the direction of that uncoordination. You don't have the nose wheel to kind of right you immediately. So it can be a, can be a challenge air, airplane handling wise. So kind of an odd data point, but I always like to tell it any chance I get to. Uh, so when I did my master's at the University of Tennessee Space Institute in flight test engineering, um, one of the gentlemen that uh, I think of as a mentor, wonderful guy, Rich Renato, was a test pilot at Bombardier, and he did some stuff with ice shapes on the Twin Otter. There's a pretty famous video. They put foam shapes on the leading edge of the airplane, and uh, I think they were essentially taking it to its limits. And Rich is a small guy, former like F-100 pilot, Vietnam era, incredible dude. There's a famous video of the airplane literally snapping the flight controls out of his hands because the aero load from that ice on the wing in flight was too severe. And I don't know how they, they fixed it essentially, but it's always given me a great respect for flying an airplane through ice. And I have zero experience doing it. Anytime I get close in my little airplane or something in general aviation, I'm nope, nope, nope. Let's either climb or descend or something, but get out of this. I've not flown in ice, but I think you have. Any good stories or any uh, kind of data points to share on flying in ice? 
Yeah, that's a great video. I, I just wanted to add that we used to watch those videos for our training every year uh, going up to Alaska with the Twin Otter. It's a known quantity. This Twin Otter is not going to fly a whole lot higher than 12,000 feet, certainly unless you get oxygen, and even then it doesn't perform, you know, the way you'd like it to perform above 12,000 feet. And um, you're going to be a nice. It's uh, almost a, a definitive statement. So, um, yeah, we used to watch that video as me method of training um, in addition to going through the AFM and making sure that we had our personnel qualification standards, go through our PQS and do all the discussions, make sure we check each other and make sure everybody is understanding the procedures going into ICE. Because you might operate in one of these southeast right whale, northeast right whale, uh, one of these flight regimes where you might not experience icing very often in southeast Florida in a twin otter below 12,000 feet. But now you go up into Alaska and it's your bread and butter. So transiting for extended periods of time in the Midwest in the wintertime in a twin otter definitely build up a significant amount of ice. I've always been impressed by how the airplane could handle it. Uh, knock on wood, but I haven't experienced that uh, sharp grab of the controls. Uh, hopefully it stays that way. And um, we also have a strong, again, going to our ORM, time critical ORM, making sure that all our people are empowered to make go, no-go decisions. And in times, we have so much data and using it well is, uh, is so important, making sure that crews check the, check the notums, check any kind of pilot reports, understand when it's trace icing, when you can get through it, when the otter is going to be able to shed it, and when you get those urgent advisories, uh, when you get a pirate that looks like heavy icing, uh, that is not something you want to go into in any aircraft. Generally speaking, in Alaska, the icing that I've encountered has been um, mixed, mixed and light rime, and generally the airplane takes care of it very well. Um, the wings are not made to go fast. Um, this thing is truing out at, uh, at 140 and 150. Uh, it's certainly not going to break any land speed records, um, but with its uh, powerful PT6 engines, that basically means that a lot of this plan form, a lot of the wing is dedicated to a lot of excess lift. So the, the big Hershey bar wings are great for controllability. They're great for low speed controllability. Uh, they're great for icing. Uh, it has so much residual lift. It can, it can definitely deal with that despite having so many things out there like the non-retractable gear that, that, can, that can build it up. It can deal with it. So I'll be honest, before I knew you, before I had the chance to take this great tour, when I think of NOAA Aviation, I think of those beautiful P3s, and I think of the Gulfstream, the jet, because what oh, I think a lot of us know, you watch the Weather Channel or any other kind of uh, you know, open source stuff on the internet, is you guys fly into hurricanes. And I think that is absolutely insane and awesome. And I know nothing about it, so I have so many questions. Uh, but again, we talked about the progression of airplanes in your career. You stepped up to fly the Gulfstream. So what's uh, kind of the mission set? And uh, let's, talk, let's talk about hurricanes. The mission set of the Gulfstream, the primary one is the hurricanes. That's what we're doing June 1st through November 30th. That's hurricane season officially. So we're on call during those times and we're ready to uh, support the National Hurricane Center and the nation to, uh, to forecast the track and intensity of hurricanes. Uh, we also have a couple projects that we do throughout the winter. Uh, Grab D is a project where we uh, where we update the gravitational datum of the United States. When you look at your, your uh, altitude and it get, you get a GPS altitude from your cell phone uh, or you see any uh, vertical assessment of where you are, like even charts, nautical charts or paper charts, um, everything has a vertical datum associated with it. The altitude of that thousand foot cell phone tower in the Midwest, that's associated with the vertical datum. So it really indirectly impacts everything we do. And NOAA has been working on a big 30 year project to update the vertical datum of the United States. In some areas of the United States, it's not too far off. It's just, uh, it might be a, a question of inches. But some areas, like out in American Samoa or Guam, 
this vertical data might be significantly off. And uh, small differences uh, could result in big differences in, uh, in mapping applications. So how do you measure that? What, what sensors are you flying on board the jet that gives you that data? That's a good question. Uh, it's a gravimeter. Uh, so they have a, uh, it's made by a, a company called Microcost, and it's a gravimeter that measures uh, on the minute orders of magnitude of gravity. So flying at 23,000 feet in the King Air or the Gulf Stream at 300 knots, this thing can figure out what the gravity is of the areas that it's going over. And generally we're flying these lines, sort of mowing the lawn, doing lines that are spaced by about uh, 30 miles, um, getting the overlap that they need to uh, update this data. And um, yeah, it's uh, the sensitivity of the, of the instrument is such that you can't move in the airplane, like you can't get out of your seat. So once you're in on one of these survey lines, you're not allowed to touch the throttles. You can't move the airplane. You can't change your heading and you can't get up to say, use a bathroom or something. Uh, also problems with airspace management because a controller thinks nothing of NOAA 68, I need you to make a right 10 for weather, for traffic, for whatever. And now it's up to you, you've just gotten an order from a controller to kind of deconflict that. How badly do you need me to make this right 10? Can we, can you make him go left 20? Um, and it's one of those subtle conversations where you don't want it to get combative. Uh, this controller is one, you know, we talked about cockpit resource management, crew resource management. Um, this controller is part of your team and you need to integrate them into your team in order for them to uh, add value. Uh, the last thing you want them to be is an adversary. And now this is like an obstacle to be bested instead of a valuable member of your team. Well, I'm guessing when you're, uh, you're on high, we've got the P3 working the, I'm going to say the lower level, big air quotes here, but the lower level of the storm. In the Gulf Stream, you guys are the high bird. You're above a lot of it. Can you kind of talk through what those mission sets are like, maybe how high, how fast, how long you're out there, and then what you're actually doing in the storm? Sure. Our Gulf Stream generally uh, does eight-hour missions and climbs up immediately to 41,000 feet. So we carry our expendable drop sound units, which are weather instruments that we're dropping down through the storm. Usually we'd have about 35 to 40 of these that we'd put out the air aircraft. They've each got a drogue chute on them and they go down at about 3,500 feet per minute. And as they're going down, they're sending up pressure, temperature, humidity at about three cycles per second, so three, three times per second, they're sending all that information back to the jet as they go down, and we're getting that whole data stream. We're generally taking off at max gross weight, uh, just due to the fact that we want more data. If we could get nine hours out of the plane, we'd get nine hours, but we can really practically only get eight, uh, so we fly eight hours and uh, just drop about every 10 minutes and make sure we get as much data as we can. Um, a lot of our more recent um, mission sets have been one outer ring where we're about at 150 miles away from the storm, one inner ring where we're about 50 to 75 miles from the storm, and then we do an outflow boundary, kind of mowing the lawn, doing a zigzag pattern and figuring out where the highs, where the lows are, and where that's gonna steer the storm. Nerdy little uh, aviation data point here for uh, those of you with ForeFlight. One of the cooler things that ForeFlight started recently doing is graphically depicting NOTAMs. And I remember, gosh, this was for Hurricane Ian, which we're going to talk about next. But I remember seeing this very strange zigzag NOTAM that went into the airspace, and it mentioned a NOAA Gulfstream. Well, that was you flying that, that mission. Um, and like you said, mowing the lawn, I mean, that was uh, essentially getting air data prior to the storm. I mean, I think the storm was still south of Cuba at the time. Uh, but what was Hurricane Ian like? Could you kind of tell us uh, any, uh, any good times flying that storm? Obviously, it hit very close to home, not too far from the Lakeland area. I think my takeaway from the storm was really about the impact to the local economy and the local people, uh, understanding the, the impact of our data, understanding where the storm is going to go, and when it's going to get there and how bad it's going to be is so important. The difference between it going north 50 miles or south 50 miles or hitting dead on on Tampa Bay 
uh, really makes an enormous difference on the emergency managers and on the lives of the people on the ground. Never is that more true than when it's people that you know and love and work with every day. So it was uh, definitely a, a good experience to be part of something that matters and be part of a team that was all working for the, the same outcome. But it was also a challenge to keep focused on the mission and make sure that we did everything safely. I think that was uh, also good to reflect on our organizational background. I always say that we stand on the shoulders of giants. What we do to make this safe is not the airplanes. The airplanes are awesome, but they are just airplanes. If we don't do things, in a, this is really what makes us unique as human beings that we learn. We're able to learn from the previous generations, and uh, we've been doing this safely for over 70 years. And it's really been that iterative process of doing this over and over again and being able to learn those little lessons over time so that we don't have to learn a big lesson. You mentioned those little lessons. How much transfer is there between prior aviators that have been in your job that have done these missions in, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to say less capable, but earlier generation airplanes? What are things that they've passed along to you that kind of guide you as an aircraft commander and mission commander? I'd say the aeronautical decision making, the crew resource management, I'd say that's the biggest thing is that you can't know everything. You have a lot of people in the back of the airplane that know a ton. Um, even talking to the controllers, the controllers can add a ton of options into your quiver uh, if you utilize them. And that's something that's so true across different uh, organizations and across different mission sets and across different platforms. So uh, that's something that the P3s who fly through the storm and have a much larger component that's in the aircraft. They also have a very dynamic mission set penetrating the eye wall and going into the center of the storm. A super dynamic mission set. They have to be have their um, crew resource management, their communication totally dialed in. And they also have had a you know, incidences in the past where they've said, okay, that didn't work out well, let's refine this, let's make a policy, let's make a procedure, let's make better training for this. Uh, it's all different, very small tweaks to learn as an organization and to make sure that we implement the same procedure each time so that even if we change personnel, even if, you know, half your personnel has to leave due to the organizational change, uh, organizational needs to move or something, uh, you can still execute the same, uh, same mission set. So one of the first places uh, I got to take the 53 off station, so I was a Norfolk guy, but the first dead I ever got to do was down to Panama City. Not too long after that really awesome month of June that we spent down there doing some sonar testing, I went on deployment, and I remember watching the news, and a really, really big hurricane, really big storm pointed its way right toward Tyndall Air Force Base, Panama City, a uh, really very devastating storm, Hurricane Michael. That was a, that was a really tough storm, and um, those ones that come up through the Gulf later in the season, they just seem to spin up out of seemingly nowhere. Uh, we spend a lot of our early part of our season looking towards Africa, and those storms kind of brew up as waves off of Africa, and you have like a week's notice, and you sort of see it going. Uh, this year we actually went out to Cape Verde and tried to get as early warning as we could uh, once they saw those tropical waves starting. But those late in the season storms in the Gulf, uh, they kind of brew up out of nowhere and then they're a Cat 5 right on your on your doorstep. So Michael was, uh, was a challenging storm. The, the jet behaved really well and we, we had some really successful uh, missions around it. And uh, the the uncertainty in the in the model, you know, it, we weren't sure if it was going to come for that area or the Pensacola area um, or the Mexico Beach area where it ended up. Um, and then after the jet landed, um, I we didn't have a crew for our emergency response bird. So after the last mission on that set. I switched hats and went over to the King Air and flew emergency response for that, that storm. So that was a cool experience just in organizational flexibility in that I got to fly the storm, get the early warning signs, 
get the, the reconnaissance and surveillance data to get the advance notice of the storm and then jump into another airplane and take pictures after the storm and make sure that people had the best information, emergency managers, uh, people coming back to their houses to understand um, what the situation was on the ground. For aviators, for scientists, for folks that are interested in NOAA and coming over to your organization, what's the first step? What would you recommend for people that know nothing about NOAA? Obviously, I would say look it up online. Uh, but where would you point people in that direction if they want to be part of your organization? I would definitely say to read up on the organization and understand where your skills and where your interests could be best utilized. Um, I went the NOAA Corps route because I knew that I wanted to be operationally invested. I knew that the NOAA Corps was driving ships and flying airplanes, and here I am. I drove ships for a while, for about three years. I did small boats for a year out of New York City, and then I did airplanes now for about 13 years. And it's uh, been such a fun ride. I realize that isn't the path for everybody. So there are some people that want to do research. Uh, so there are plenty of NOAA research labs that have uh, GS and you know government service jobs that um, that more fit the uh, NOAA research as well as administrative jobs. Uh, the NOAA Commission Corps is a, a great route for people looking to fly airplanes and drive ships. Uh, and in the end, NOAA Commission Corps really makes for a, a skill set of people that are going to lead the organization strategically in the long term. Uh, we make people that notably become admirals and are obviously strategic level leaders in the organization, but a lot of people don't realize that all the line offices of NOAA have people in the upper echelons that have had NOAA Corps experience. Sometimes it isn't obvious because they aren't wearing the uniform at the moment like an admiral is, but many people in our, in our line offices have had that background and understand that um, operational uh, operating ships, operating aircraft, and have integrated that into their long-term leadership journey. Looking all the way back, Ensign Nardi joining NOAA. You've got a lot of experience now, and obviously you're not done yet, and that's one of my next questions is where you're going next. But looking all the way back, what would you, what would you tell him, things that you've learned in, in all your time and your experience so far? I definitely recommend to keep flexible. Um, I think it's something that I've done well in my leadership journey and I've attributed to a lot of my success is uh, being flexible and taking the opportunity that's there, um, trying to learn as much as possible. It's one of the reasons I chose to go out on the hydrographic survey ships because they, they have such a diverse skill set of driving the ships, driving the small boats, diving, doing tide stations doing the actual surveys. It's a, it's a great wide skill set, um, but it does require a lot of flexibility. And when that thing comes up that you have to do, we need somebody to correct charts for two weeks, being the first in line to volunteer is important, and it does make a, make a big difference in the long term. What's next for you here at NOAA? I'm currently interested in a legislative affairs billet uh, that's up in Washington, D.C., uh, it kind of gets involved with uh, a lot of the uh, more legislative political aspects of where Congress is going and the appropriations process and about uh, legislative uh, giving that knowledge of NOAA to either a congressman or a, um, a committee. So understanding that aspect of the, of the organization has always been fascinating to me. Um, I did a, a winter internship with a, with a congressperson uh, when I was an undergrad, and it was always something that I kind of had in the background of my mind way back when. Uh, but it's funny how the winding roads kind of eventually converge into one. Uh, so it would be really, really rewarding to, to do that as a NOAA Corps officer and also do it with such a wide background of skill sets of a mission set that I'm so passionate about making sure that the NOAA mission brings the most value to uh, to the U.S. Uh, citizens and the taxpayers. The perfect answer. It sounds like you're a shoe-in for the job. That's awesome. <laughs> well, Commander Nardi, thank you again so very much. You've taken, uh, for again, those that can't watch and, and see, you've taken your whole morning showing us around the hangar. Uh, 
explaining to uh, several of us what NOAA is and, and obviously everyone listening now as well. So I can't say thank you enough. Um, it's really, again, I, I jokingly say I see the tracks on ForeFlight. I see the data that you produce and I see how it works um, on that level. But it's, uh, it's very humbling to get to see such a, a small organization of incredibly intelligent people that do really hard work. So thank you again for taking your time uh, to, to speak with us. And uh, you get the last word. Anything I didn't ask, anything you wanted to say before we uh, close it out? It's just been a pleasure. I appreciate you taking your time coming all the way from Pensacola. Um, I think the aviation community is so small, uh, shockingly small. Uh, I, I think the, uh, the amount that you'll run into the same people over and over again is, uh, is surprising. So I, I hope this is able to get the word out, and I can't li wait to listen to more episodes of the podcast to come. Thanks so much, sir. I appreciate it. Thank you.